When Jacob Rees set out to make his book, How the Other Half Lives, what he was addressing was the plight of immigrants and housing in New York City. The title comes from an old saying saying that half the world doesn't know how the other half lives. And indeed, this was not the world of Fifth Avenue with its glamour and its shops. This was the rag picker alley that we see here where this poor man worked. His job was essentially finding rags and collecting rags around the city. Where is he going to live? And the following slides are going to show us what it was like in New York City at the time of the immigrants, when the time when the immigrants moved in and were looking for anywhere to live. Reese's work as a photographer brought him all over the city to some pretty unsavory places, such as this one called Murderer's Row. Every man in this picture is wanted by the police, and in fact, a lot of these places the police wouldn't even go into. They humored Jacob Reese and allowed them to uh, allowed him to take their picture, even though it looks pretty light out. This is actually taken at midnight, but with the invention of flash photography. He could capture even the darkest areas with his new thing. And he only lit one house on fire, too, while doing it. This was the New York City of the day. This was a walking city where, because transportation was limited to horses and carriages, as you can tell from the road apples in the street there, and the lack of automobiles, Everywhere in New York needed to be within walking distance. And this meant that immigrants needed to be close to their jobs. And what we see are we have, you have stores on the first level and then you have flats or apartments up above. And this is, the following pages are going to detail what it was like living in New York City at the time. You can already see that this is, well, kind of familiar. It looks very different without cars. You can see in the upper left-hand corner the Hebrew lettering on the signs. This was part of the neighborhood where the, a lot of the Jewish immigrants lived, and they would advertise in their signs to each other. You'll never see something like this on the streets of New York City today. I mean, if you look at it, it's made of wood. It's got a tar paper roof. It's crooked. It's falling down. But it was very valuable because it was in New York City. And it also shows that there were no laws at this time. People lived wherever they could. There were no building codes, no laws that said what was safe, what was healthy. And the only thing that drove housing in New York City was the idea of profit. If you could make money off it, you could do it. And nobody was going to say no. This rear house is a prime example of people taking advantage of that. So this is a wooden house, a flimsy wooden structure that was thrown up on what should have been the backyard behind an apartment building. The only reason we get to see this is because the apartment in front of it was torn down. Otherwise, it would have backed right up to this wooden structure. The demand for housing in New York City was so extreme, was so high, that anywhere that could be justifiably called housing was put into service as housing and it you could charge people money to live there. This is a lot different from New York City. There were no garbage men at the times, as you can see by the by the absolute piles of filth and animal bones and wood and just plain old garbage on the streets. New York City was a pretty, pretty unhealthy place at the time. You can see from this that the streets were muddy. In some places they were paved, other places not. They had cobblestones. But you see a lot of standing water, which means mosquitoes, which means bugs, which means disease. New York City at this time had epidemics of cholera, yellow fever, and other things go ripping through the city. And to make it worse pack in 8 million people living in close quarters. Like all big cities of the time, New York City heated all of its buildings with coal, which left a nasty residue of ash and smoke and pollution 
throughout the city. London had their had the nickname the Big Smoke during this period, and New York City was not much better. With every household burning coal to heat it, the clouds of smoke and the pollution were unreal. And yet, coming for the jobs, you had thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in New York City that needed to be housed. So they developed a system of dense living where people would crowd into apartment buildings instead of individual homes in order to live there. And you can see them hanging off their their hanging out their washing right here to dry. In this slide, you can see that there are more than just places to live. This is where people did a lot of living from doing the cooking and the women doing the laundry in the backyard and drying out the lawn and the kids playing at the same time. This slide shows what these apartments were originally built for. This was called a tenement of the old style where each flat or each one level floor consisted of a couple bedrooms, a kitchen, a sitting room, meant for one family. However, if you can't afford the rent, what you do is you get a roommate, or three, or four, or five, or as many as you can to make it that much more affordable. They would subdivide the rooms and bring in more families, as we're going to see in the next picture. The colors on this show that they have 12 families living in a flat originally intended for just one family. Each of those green rooms is lucky enough to have a window and light coming in and fresh air. All the blue rooms do not. There was no electricity in 1863. There was only candlelight and no fresh air coming into these kind of landlocked rooms with no windows in them whatsoever. The red ones are um, hallways and common areas like that, so they didn't really count. So this was the context that immigrants found themselves when they looked for housing in New York City. Like this poor Italian mother, here, this is her housing. This is her one room, and it has everything. You can see in the right-hand corner, you can see the stove where she would cook her food and heat the place with, of course, with coal. You can see that she has two wash basins, and that board that looks kind of like a ladder to the left, she would put that down between the two basins and put that straw tick mattress across it. That would serve as her bed. And she has a baby. And Jacob Rees was practically standing outside of the apartment to take this picture. And at least these guys knew each other. These were seven Greek brothers, seven, all crammed into one apartment. And if you can even call it an apartment, they had to build a loft to hoist themselves up so they could get another bed in there. But if you look, if you count carefully, you can see there are seven people. There are three up top and there are four down below. Seven people in one apartment. Again, you can see the stove with the, with the pans and the pots. Reese was out in the hallway taking this picture. And this is why Lou Reed said, somewhere a landlord is laughing till he wet his pants. Because think about this, they could charge whatever they wanted. Now at least these guys knew each other. There was a system called the hotbed system or the repeater system, which meant that when you went off to work, you sold, or you, sorry, you rented your spot in bed to somebody else. Well, you're not there. You're not working on it. So or you're, you're off working. So they're going to come in and sleep. Or sometimes it's two people sleeping there. One for one eight-hour shift, and then the other for another eight-hour shift. Desperate times called for desperate measures. This poor guy was actually paying someone to sleep in a basement. His bed, if you want to call it that, is up on two planks because 
at high tide, the East River would flood this apartment, and oftentimes rats came in with the flood. So he would stay up here, and Reese actually saw him living there and took his picture and woke the guy up in the middle of it. In this picture, you see a father and a son working at a table. What's interesting is that the dynamic is reversed. The father is the illiterate one. He is the one who is an illiterate peasant who can't read nor write and certainly can't speak English. On the right is his son, who, if he's lucky enough, could go to school to learn English and to learn how to read, to learn how to write. And so the family dynamic there was worse, or was reversed. Most children had to work at a young age because their parents needed the wages to survive. Many tenement owners would bring the work to their, um, to their tenants and say, well, we have a job for you. You can stay here and I'll just deduct this from your wages. In this picture, the Bohemian family, everybody's working. The mother and father are rolling tobacco into cigars. You can see under the guy's forearm the number of cigars. Now he get paid by the piece, so he get paid for however many he managed to create. The boy on the right is the one stripping tobacco from the, the leaves from the stems, so it could be a good, uh, a good piece to roll from. When you work by the piece, you don't get paid very much, and every time you take a break, you're losing an opportunity to make more money. So working in these conditions, this is the birth of what we call the sweatshop labor, when you're working here in these apartments and working hard. Before all of our clothes were made in New York City, they were made in the garment section of New York City. And here, immigrants would get hired to do the finishing work, to do the sewing on of the silk linings and jackets or sewing on fancy buttons, the jobs that the machines at the time couldn't do. And these were small private companies who are, who are operating as best they can, not making a lot of money. And, but this is where their skills would take them. And oftentimes, they would work right in the tenement itself. If you remember Life of the Sweatshop Girl, I always think of this girl as the person who wrote that account because here she is smiling. And we, we think this is, oh, this is so terrible. But a lot of immigrants saw this as opportunity. This was a job they could do. They could do it well. They could make money. And some immigrants did succeed and succeed enough to maybe start their own company or buy their own tenement. Many of the tenement owners were former immigrants themselves. So this does sort of show that, yeah, there was some opportunity in this system. Of course, this shows the dark side. There were no laws against child labor. There were no laws against child abuse, as you can tell from this kid's black eye. There weren't a lot of laws about anything at that time. It was not considered any of the public's business, and government operated kind of as laissez-faire. Let business do what they want to do. And for the immigrants, they wanted a job, and they were willing to put up with this instead of uh, you know, filing complaints, and there was no one to complain to anyways. So this looks like a daycare, but in reality, this woman is having all of the children she's supposed to be minding put together dried flower arrangements. In, in lieu of paying for daycare, you would send your children to her because they are much too young to work. But in most immigrants family in most immigrant families everybody worked they needed the wages the lucky ones were the ones who went to school here you can see the physical toll of doing a lifetime of work like this if you look at the woman's hands how they are gnarled swollen with arthritis from doing fine work with needles for years on ends how their eyes are blind from uh, working in inadequate lights again there were not a lot of rules so 
housing came with the tenements, but it came at a price as well. Now we're going to get into the other ways that people found housing, some of the less, um, less usual ways of finding it. When it got cold, they would oftentimes open up shelters like this one where they had men sleeping in hammocks on one side and then on the other side of the building they had the women sweep, sleeping in hammocks as well. One method that Jacob Reese described in his book is carried on proudly by college students today and that's called a rent party. When the rent is due, you go buy a keg of beer and a pile of solo cups. You charge people five bucks at the door. They can drink all they want. Well, the same thing went on with the immigrants as well. They would hold rent parties in the bottom of the basement. And uh, Reese would call them the stale beer dives. And he called them that because the immigrants couldn't afford to go out and get brand new kegs of beer. So what they would do is they would go out and find the almost empty kegs that the restaurants would toss up on the sidewalk and they would drain them of all of the leftover beer, all the nasty scummy stuff at the bottom of the keg. They'd collect this in something and they'd spike it with something cheap like formaldehyde to give a little bit of zip and then they would sell it to people for pennies. And it benefited not only them because they would make money towards their rent, but it would also give the people that were there a place to crash for the night, as you can tell from the drunken fools right in front of us. Here is one of these stale beer dives, and you can see that uh, this is sort of a mixed race place. You have two Germans, you have an African American, and uh, I guess when you're that poor, uh, not too many people get fussed about discrimination, huh? Women like these frequently resorted to prostitution to find a way. They would go home with a man to make money, possibly steal from him, but find a way of life. And Jacob Rees was appalled at all of this. He thought of the immorality of all of this, the immorality of drinking, the immorality of prostitution, and he thought of the children growing up, living around, and in this environment. And indeed, here's this man passed out. I don't know why he took his shoe off, but he did. In Chinatown, the area where it was dominated by Chinese people, they brought over the drug of opium. And here in this opium den, people would go in and buy, a, buy the drug and they would pass out and they would spend the night there. Reese was especially concerned for the children. Now, these two young, young guys, they told Reese they didn't reckon they lived nowhere and couldn't tell you how old they were, whether their parents ran off or were killed or had simply kicked them out. This is beyond the point. These guys lived on the streets, and there were a lot of them. He called them street urchins, and these were kids that were essentially growing up on the street, and he worried about our country. What would happen when these young kids grow up to be adults? What would happen? Starting their life of crime at an early age simply to survive did not bode well for our country. They were happy to demonstrate for Jacob Reese how they did the trick. In other words, they would wait until they saw a drunk staggering down the street. They'd trip him up, they'd knock him over, and they'd steal his wallet or run his pockets and take whatever they could. This is how young kids survived on the streets. They did whatever they could, living by their wits and uh, frequently coming to a bad end. Kids weren't the only criminals. This is the infamous C Street gang that lived underneath the C Street docks. 
their job, as they called it, would be to swim out to the, uh, to the boats in the harbor, climb up them and try and steal whatever they could, and then sell it back to people for less on shore. When it became very cold, oftentimes the police station would throw open their doors and people would have to come into the jails when it was terribly cold. Either that or freeze on the streets. And uh, there, there's something demeaning about coming in with hardened criminals, but either that or freeze on the streets. And here inside the jail cell where you would sleep on a wooden plank, essentially, with whatever clothes you brought in, no blankets, there was just uh, enough heat to keep you warm. Here you can see this gentleman uh, to the right standing. He's got a vest on, he's got a pair of pants, he's got a nice chain watch, and he's got rags on his feet trying to keep his feet warm. Reese got a kick out of this guy. This guy was proud of building his house on somebody else's roof. He had scavenged enough materials, leftover stuff, and he made his own little house, and he was going to live there, and he was quite proud of it, as you can tell from this picture. This is the last picture in Reese's book. This poor creature lived in the dump, and... As long as I've been teaching, I still can't tell if this is a man or a woman, and I suppose it doesn't matter. The tragedy is that Reese saw that as long as things were driven by money, as long as housing was driven by a capitalist system, we were going to have winners and we were going to have losers. We would have that landlord laughing till he wet his pants because the immigrants were forced to live wherever they could. They were forced to live in the most expensive area that they could and do whatever became necessary to survive. In this case, subdividing and cutting up their rooms and jamming people in, all of it meant it was unhealthy. And Reese ends his book with a story called The Man with the Knife. And he describes how this man who had just seen one of his children die of a fever because he's living in one of these filthy, unhealthy apartments and he comes out and he sees a carriage going by. More wealth than he would ever make in his lifetime. And something inside of him snaps. And he draws a knife and he runs into the crowd, slashing and slashing. And he is just sort of taken away. But Reese is warning us too. People can't live like this. You can't keep people down in such situations without an explosion not too far off. What New York City would do about it would be something else. And as we can see, even now, you know, 150 years later after Jacob Reese wrote this, is that not much has changed. If anything, housing problems are still with us from places like Boston, New York City, even outside of Boston, Route 128, housing prices are obscene. Now, thankfully, living in Western Mass, we don't see that. But again, this country has never quite figured out its housing problem. How do we build housing in a fair and equitable way, yet still use the capitalist system that we have? Well, we're going to see what's going to happen after immigration.